So we're doing the truck back there after. And we'd already talked about the model, right? The transit model. So now we're talking about. That's a truck. And then there's another that truck. There's a wheel angle. Control variables. Uh, now that it also gives the current state information. Controller, the current state, and figures out the wheel angle to make the truck do what we want in the next time step. Put a hat on that because you may not exactly match that. And then the neural net for the, we already talked about the, the model, the neural net for the controller. I did that last time, right? It has this, all six states going in and the way and the real angle going out, right? All right, so how do we train this? Here's our target. Remember, we start at time zero. So we start at state zero. We drive around backwards for a while. We hope we hit the dock. So the only target that we have is at some final time. In the paper, he calls it as T subscript N or just time step number N. So you go in time steps into the future. And then the target F, oh, let's see, we call it, we call it adaptive T. I don't know, let's not do that. That's more confusing. So the x and y locations, the final time, then, are going to be the dock location, which we talked about is actually just the origin. So wherever your dock is, you place the origin of the dock. So you want this to happen, but track starts at S0. And then it drives to time step one, time step two, keeps going forward all the way until whatever we define as the final time. And then we take that state, we'll compare it to this. That means we only have a target, not for each time step, but only at the final time. But we can calculate an error at the output, we can calculate an error here. Based on that, oh, we also wanted theta to be zero, right? We said we wanted to line up. So the error at the final time, the state vector here is X of the trailer, Y of the trailer, Theta of the trailer. I'm putting N on it because this is at our final time. And it's cab, and Theta and cab at the final time. So this is the final time. And so that's the actual system output at the final time. And so to get an error, we simply subtract the actual value from the target. So this would be um, the error vector for all of these. And in fact, in our list, let's see that the cab comes first, right? In our state vector. 
Yeah, so this is actually D4, D5, D6. This is D1, D2, D3 in the order that we define the state variables. So I want all those to be zero, but how about the cap? Are you guys with me? All right, so we run all the way to the end of the final time, and then we're comparing the targets to what we actually got. And we're going to create this error vector that's then going to be errors assigned to all of the neurons in that output layer. So what's our target for the cap? We really only said we want the trailer back then, right? We said the cap is going to be there. So really, we don't care. So I don't care, how do we encode it? They don't care in the error. It means we just set this error to be zero or we say wherever it ends up, that's totally fine with us. So we just set the errors to zero because we don't care. It doesn't really matter, we, don't, we haven't specified. So we set these errors to reflect how far off it was from where we wanted it to be. And then that gives us an error vector to assign to each neuron in that control. But you might be sitting there wondering, well, what's the final time? So you have to decide, well, what is the final time? For each run. So let's draw a picture. Here's the dock, here's the truck, tractor trailer, on the initial position here. And it backs up, it backs up, and backs up. So what are we gonna call it then? Yeah, exactly. So maybe it, it's the dock here, not lined up and then it's not in the right position, right? So in fact, that's exactly what he did. He said this is a truck. It's dock. So the dock's here. What if it gets really bad? So instead of heading toward the dock, we head to off this way. We just like go forever. As we could. But that kind of reduces the chance of learning how to do the dock. And so what he did was he set a boundary. And if it went outside the boundary, then he called it good. It just it went so far out of bounds. So it goes out of bounds. All right, so we've defined that. He runs the truck. The controller, the truck model is already trained. Back the truck up, back the truck up, it either goes out of bounds or hits the dock, we calculate the error. And what do we do with that? Because this error is only the error at the final time. It's not an error of anything that happened along the way. All right, we don't know whether it's good for the truck to kind of head this way for a little bit before it goes and heads for the dock. It's pretty clear that. Probably doing a loop is not all that good, but you never know. So here's the secret to what he did was he has an error in the neurons here, back props it through the truck to the controller. And you can train the controller at that point at the final time. But he keeps going. And so I need to draw a picture all the way across, starting from the initial condition to the final time. And show you how he back propagates this error through time through each of the time steps. So I'm going to short can notation this thing. I'm going to start over here and I'm going to erase. So we're going to draw the controller this is the C that it takes. 
That's zero. And it puts out W zero. It goes into the truck model. And S zero comes. It goes into that. And then we get S one, right? That's the first time. So this is our shorthand of drawing this. I'm not going to draw the track here every time. I'm just drawing the truck model. Because that's what we need. Of course, the truck is doing its thing. It's, it's going back, but we need the model here. <clears throat> So then, in the next time step, the controller takes this, and the controller calculates W1. It goes into the track. And we take this state, go into the truck model, and we get this. So this is just the truck backing up under the controller. We'll do one more. So we'll do the controller. We get the line one two. Eight two goes into the truck model. The truck. We get eight three. Dot 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 represents all the pictures that you tired to draw. And then over here, we have the state. At the end of minus one, so that's one step before we hit the dock or whatever. Controller translates a wheel angle. That state goes into the truck model. And we get the state that hit the dock or went out of bounds at the final time. Along the way, inside each one of these boxes, remember, is a neural net, right? Like the controller is a neural net. Like this. And inside the track, you can run that. Now we got a big layer here. Like that. And in fact, this. Value goes in here, and then the state vector goes in here, and it goes in here, right? So, in each instance here, you have the x is the output of all of the neurons. That's the and then here we have the outputs of all the neurons in step two. Okay, so I need to make that as a subscript because otherwise it's going to mess it up. So put the subscript as a superscript. And then here we have a state vector at time step two. So let's do that. That's zero, one, this is two, this is And then all the way to here, that's again. So we have the outputs of all of the neurons in the network inside each one of these at each time step. Because we just calculated going forward all the way through all the neurons. Just one big giant neural group. So then we take our error at this final time here. When we calculate the de error delta for the output neurons, it's going to be 
um, the error vector times f prime of each of the output terms, which is our normal back propagation calculation. So we get an error delta for the six neurons here. And then we back prop through the track. And then we back prop through the controller. And we get error deltas here for the controller for that time step. And then we can train the controller right there. But there's a lot more instances of the controller that we need to train. So we just keep going. It's all neurons. So we take this error delta and back prop. We get deltas for the controller at each time step. Can you picture this in your head? All right, it's just a neural net. You go neuron to neuron using the backdrop rule with delta. And then you use those deltas to train the neurons, the weights, and all of the controllers. So that's why he calls this back propagation through time. And I call this unfolding the network. In time, because we just draw a picture of it at each time step. All right, questions to this point. I know this is throwing a lot at you at once. But if you forget the truck and the controller and you just think of it as neurons and neurons and neurons and neurons all the way through, and then we get an error, we just do the back propagation equations backwards through the whole thing. All right, so now we can train the controller with each individual error here. Now remember, we're not training the truck. Because the truck model is not at fault for this error. This is an error due to the controller. So we're just going to train the, the, the controller. So we can train all of them. Or maybe we say, oh, way back early on, this controller, when it did its thing way back here, was at fault for the error there. And you know, we have to figure this out. So what do you think? Are some of the controllers more at fault than the others? Should we spread the fault the, the blame equally? Should we say, oh, we all did our job really well up here, but then you screwed up at that last mile time step. Now that doesn't make sense because the truck you know, ended way off and was responsible for the controllers the entire time. So we just average. I mean, the easiest way is uh, you do a weight update, so all the weights in the neural net. And we sum up the weight update rules, so it's the learning rate times the delta times the activation vector, and then you just divide by the, the number of time steps. Sorry, it's a single step, right? I'm not being real careful with the, the subscripts on this, right? You have to match up the delta with the activation of that neuron and all of that. See so this average. All right, another question. The weights in the controller here, and there's weights in the controller here, and there's weights in the controller here. And there's weights in the controller here. So we have different ways we have to update it each time. You're nodding your head. This is this neural net, right? It has weights. Is the neural net here different? The answer is actually everybody's right, yes or no. It's the same weights and neural net, but it had different activations. So we have to pair that together. So the weights here and here and here 
and here are the same, but the activations are different. So that's why we have to keep track of well, what are the activations and what are the errors and then update them. Does that actually pretty amazing? Like this thing work. So in the paper, he says he did twenty thousand total initial conditions and backups. So he puts the truck in the initial condition, have it back up and do a really bad job. He'd do it again, just keep doing it twenty thousand times and train this way. Uh, he said that initially he started the truck out really close to the dock. It is kind of like if you're learning to do it, you probably do that, right? Start out close to the dock, that way it wouldn't drive so long before it went out of bounds. And then later, as it got better and better, he started farther away from the dock at more difficult angles. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of plots that he has in the paper. Um, in some of them, you'll see that early truck motion may be a direction to go away from the dock. But it's actually the optimal path to get to the dock. This paper is posted on the blackboard. I have to restart my system because these are dirty. <laughs> now I don't. Should be able to read it here quick, right? right? This. Let me share my screen. Got pictures of the neural nets in the paper. I did it justice to drawing those. So there's a picture where he's showing the initial state and then the time lapse of the backup and then the final state. So that's the results, kind of results that we're looking at. So that's where he started out really close. Here's some tests. He shows the drag this bigger. He shows the initial position of the truck here. And so it's sitting here at time zero. Notice that it's pointed away. So this is a difficult problem. So it has to learn to loop around, get lined up with the dock, and do this. Remember, this thing can't go forward. I mean, if a, a human driver would have taken this truck and driven around like this to get lined up and then backed in, right? So this is even harder than that kind of a problem. Here's a jackknife state in the truck. The controller learned how to get the truck out of this jackknife state and then back around to the dock in the final state. And then here's another example of it pointing completely away and then learns to loop around. I really did a really good job. Quite amazing. 
So with every application, if I haven't said the main three things, I think there's three things you need to ask. So the three things are, what's the application? So what's the answer? What's the system? What's the application? Yeah, it's the backing up a tractor trailer, right? So that's one. Um, what method, what architecture did they use to train the controller? What did you say? Is this copy existing? No, we, didn't, we, we could have copied a human, but we didn't do that. Is this inverse control? Did we collect data from the system, invert it, and then train the controller? No. Is this neural model reference adaptive control? Yeah. And it's actually a more complicated example than just basic because it does this back propagation through time. But it has a model and the controller, and they're both neural nets. And we back prop through the model to train the controller. That's the key to that architecture. Oh, and the third thing is why is this a good application of, of uh, neural net control versus just some traditional DID linear control? What did I show you with regard to the equation of the motion? Very nonlinear. Yeah, it's a very nonlinear problem, so you can't do the traditional Laplace controller design or full placement or things like that. There are other nonlinear control techniques, but it's that for this particular application, the nonlinearity that makes neural nets helpful for this. Sometimes it's nonlinearity, sometimes um, it's the learning aspect of the neural net that's good. And that's also true here, right? This is able to learn to do the control and get to the dot. So those are the three basic things. If you look at any neural net application, whether it's a control application or just any other application, those are the questions you should be able to answer. Fundamentally, what was the problem? What's the system? Number two, how did they train the controller or the model or both? That's the architecture. And three, why is it a good neural net application? Are they getting ready to launch? Uh, they're loading the development, but they haven't actually started counting down yet. Okay. You're in charge of our news team. You said it was scheduled for maybe 4.30, our time? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was it. Maybe 4.30 back. Yeah, that's fine. So maybe their time in like two. Where are they? Well, they're in Texas. I was thinking, I don't know where they're Oh, so they're at the, yeah, they're, they're at the SpaceX facility in Texas. Yeah, they're going on SpaceX telephone. Probably be a rolling power blackout and they can't watch. All right, next. Let's see, uh, next I want to ask, are there any questions on the project you're working on? What to do? Monday. Next Monday, right? Questions? Is that model on the project? Um, okay. I actually have one question just now pop up about this last example. You may have mentioned it, but I think what, how did he decide how many uh, let's see, how many steps to put in the neural net? Like you go to T sub n. You mean what time step did he use? Well, just how did you decide how far to go in, to get to T sub n? Or is it just? Yeah, well, that was the deal we were talking about. It either hits the dock or it goes out of bounds. Okay. So he just keeps backing up until when I mean, they go to being in the parking lot and you hit the curb. 
or you hit the dock. Okay, so you get another car. I know. There's no other cars. <laughs> okay. okay. Would this be something that they've used, they've used like in other car situations? Like, you know, they have the automatic parallel parking or something. Would that be something that just wouldn't be effective to use or they did use that? Yeah, I mean, there's a potential for doing that. Um, there are issues, people have looked at using neural nets to control airplanes and some have been successful. The major issue is how do you certify something that it learns? In other words, how can you guarantee that the learning that it does, I mean, it may get some weird squirrel, squirrely data and end up learning something you don't want it to. Um, but I mean, eventually I think we'll learn to validate these things just like anything else. Test it in all possible scenarios. Um, if it's not, you know, if you trained it and then you shut the learning off, then it's just like any other kind of a system where you have to test it. Um, so I, I would say, I, I can't imagine that the self-driving car companies aren't doing something like this you know, with artificial intelligence, whether it's neural nets or other neural nets that are deep learning or various machine learning. Because that's the only way you can adapt to uncertainties and failures. You know, if something's you know changed in the car or you lose a camera, you've got to be able to adapt. But when people's lives are at stake, you, the, we like to be able to trace through every single step of the code and say, here's how it's going to behave in this situation. All right, while we're waiting for the rocket to launch, we're going to learn how to make alcohol. Nice. And along the way, we're also going to talk about a distillation problem. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, a paper that I actually wrote that where I, when I was working with the chemical engineering department in Rollins a long, long time ago to control the distillation plant. Um, but here's the basic idea. I mean, it's a classic thing where you have a beaker, some kind of map filled with a liquid. And inside here, we're going to look at it as being a mixture of three different chemical compounds. And they have different boiling points, which is why you can heat them up and separate them out. So the distillation is separation of the compounds. So you take this back and you put some kind of heat source, I'm drawing this flame looking thing. And that's what you always see in the movies, right, or in the TV shows. They're going to show a chemistry lab in some setting for a TV show or a movie, and almost likely they show flame and a beaker bubbling, right, and then tubes going places, and probably a distillation type of apparatus. So you heat it up, and you get vapor this thing boils and so you get the different components vaporized at different rates and then you collect them and you run it you gotta put my key all the way past the word here you run it over to a condenser and that's classically A tube that goes in a circle and spiral. Why do you have to do it spiral? And you put that in a cold region. 
so that it condenses out. Oh, thank yeah. Why do uh, the two? Why does it have to be spiral? Does it? I just. <laughs> well, I mean, that way you can get more tube wrapped and packed into a smaller space. Um, I guess it's a spiral for me because that's what you always tend to see. Uh, yeah. But stills where people are making illegal wing chun or whatever. But. So it's cold in here, and then you get liquid coming out of this end. And you collect that in the beaker. And if you do it right, you get mainly one or two of these compounds that are in the original mixture. And that's distillation, you distill it out. And it's an art form, I understand. I'm not a chemical engineer. But making moonshine is an art form. Even just putting the right mixture of grains and water and boiling it so that you don't get the wrong kind of alcohol that will kill you. Um, but it's also well, how much heat you put in here because if you put too much heat, you're going to dry everything off. And if you put too much cold over here, you'll just condense out as you drove off. So to get it to purify, you got to do this really well, or you got to do more than just this. But the control variables that we're going to be talking about are going to be things like the heat. And this thing over here is called the boiler. And this is called the condenser, so we have the heat at the boiler. And then the temperature at the condenser. So we can control this, and in fact, that's what with this simple system, that's what you got. And so you have to mess around with it. But people learned that you can make this process much better. That's what oil refineries do. They have these columns that are distillation columns. By the way, most of what I'm telling you today about this is that's all I know. I don't know a lot of the theory, the chemical theory and the equations behind it. I, when I wrote the paper, I got a whole bunch of that out of the book. I just wrote a program to do it. But a distillation column improves on this process because it allows stuff to the vapor to rise up and then condense out and run down and then reheat and rise up. And it allows a lot more control over the heating and the cooling process. So I'm going to attempt to draw a distillation column here. So this is the column. It's a tube like this. And it has the feed coming in and a way to take product out the bottom and top. Bottom, top, and side. So the column is plates. I'm going to draw it as plates like this because it's easy to visualize in two dimensions. But typically, they will be plates with that have holes in them. So you can imagine it looking like this. Let's say you feed the product that you're trying to distill in here, and it trickles down. And if you're putting heat at the bottom, some of that vaporizes and rises up, but then it cools down, it condenses on the plates and it runs down, gets hotter, and some of it heats up. And so you get this complex system in here where you've got to track all of the states of all of the vapor and the liquid and all of the three components and the temperature and how that all works. But fundamentally, you feed this in, it runs down, you take it out the bottom and you run it into the boiler down here. That reheats it. And then you can have a tube off here where we can actually collect a bottom product off this way. And 
So that would be what they call the heavy product that has the, the highest point. And does that look like a valve? Because it's supposed to be. So you can turn it on and off just like that. So you can control that. And so this thing heats up. Whether that's Heats this up, and then it sends it back into the bottom of the distillation column. So this is vapor coming out here, and that rises up here and condenses and runs down and rises and condenses, and some of it comes down here, goes into the boiler. Got it so far. And then sometimes they'll take out a side column and then send that off to another distillation column. And then out the top, they run this through what they call a partial condenser. There's a drop like this. And so then you have a tube coming out the side that produces vapor coming out here. And you send that to another distillation column. And then you pull a product off the bottom. I didn't write my words very well here. And then you send that into a tank up here. This is called a hold up tank. And then you can take product off of this with a valve. That valve didn't turn out so good. And then you run some of this through another valve. There we go. And you send that back into the distillation pump. You can see this is complicated. Isn't it? So you've got boiler vapor coming out, going up, some of the condensing, some of the trickling down, more steam coming in, condensing, boiling, vapor comes out here, you condense some of it out, it goes into the liquid in the tank, you send some of that back in, you trickle back down to the boiler, and then back out. And if you control the heat here and the cooling here, just right, you get a really pure product at the top. All right, so there's my big spiel that I want to distillation pump. So here's our control variables. Heat at the boiler, the temperature of the condenser. There's also the reflux rate. At the top, and the top product renewable. So that's these valves up here. You can take product out and you can send it back in. You have to decide what you're going to do there. There's the rate at which you're going to feed in through the feed stream there. And then there's the Removal the bottom of it. that you can control. So that's the valve here. You don't really have a valve here because whatever the heat essentially controls how much goes back into the system. And it turns out we're not going to worry about these two because these have. Just a simple output feedback controller. To maintain a constant level. Because Especially the boiler, if you let the boiler run dry, that can damage the boiler. So you want to make sure you keep the constant level of liquid in here. And then you want to maintain a constant level of liquid up here, otherwise you won't have any to send back down to the distillation. 
So our controller is going to control these two things here and the feed rate. All right, so it took 15 minutes to tell you the answer to number one, which is what is the problem, what's the system, what's the application we're trying to do. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to spend some time, and I think we'll wait till next time to do this because we want to talk about this a little bit more in general. Uh, so number one is it's a distillation column. Number two, what's the architecture? And I'll actually show you two different architectures. One is um, that blue model. So that's neural model adaptive control. And I'll also talk about what's called pseudo inverse. Are you going to get both of those? And number three, we need to spend some time on why is this a good problem for neural nets? Are we done with our distillation problem? You guys got it written down so you can build it at one point. <laughs> My neighbor and I actually did this when we were like in sixth grade. We had a hut in the backyard. We had a hot plate. And, uh, we decided to pick these flowers that were on the side of the forsythia bush, put the flowers in water, boil them, and it worked. I mean, we ran it through this little can that maybe that's why I drew the spiral, because we had a spiral through a can of ice in it. We collected what came out and then we put it in a jar and then we sat there and just looked at it all summer. <laughs> because nobody was going to drink it because we thought, well, we were smart. I mean, I did okay. I, you know, I got a PhD and the other guy that was doing it with me is actually an eye surgeon now. So we were we survived our childhood without killing ourselves. <laughs> um, but I always wonder what we really got out. What I really suspect is the flowers didn't really dissolve at all and we just got water in it. All right, so the problem is with using conventional control. In other words, why a neural net? The math model is if you want to do a traditional controller, the math model is very non linear. So there's that keyword again. But it's also huge. There's hundreds of state variables. So if you talk about a traditional controller, either in state space form or in any form, you've got a model that has hundreds of equations and hundreds of unknowns, and you have to use that to try to design your controller. Very nonlinear. Um, it has a wide range. This is number one. This is number two. It has a wide range of operating conditions. And so, what's the big deal about that? Well, typically, if it's a it's a mildly nonlinear controller, even with hundreds of state variables, you'll design a different controller for different operating states. In other words, like when you first turn on the boiler, you'll have a controller to bring it up to temperature. <clears throat> and then you'll have a separate controller that's designed to operate in steady state. And then you'll have other controllers with different gains to run to optimize different things. But if there's such a wide range of operating conditions and there's too many controllers to have to design and then schedule the game, um, there's a high lag time. And 
that makes it hard for humans to control because you you will uh, change a valve setting and then you go eat lunch and then you come back and then you test the product to see well did it get better or worse so that long lag time makes it hard so automated learning in the neural nets helps out here and in fact this these systems are usually controlled by humans who have learned by trial and error and learning from somebody else what the best way is to control these distillation plants and that's the art of it So we're going to use a neural net to model the system. And we're going to use it as a controller. And we have to do this through a wide range of operating conditions. And we'll use the words startup. That's like it's sitting there cold in the lab and you turn off the heat to steady state. So we want to model the startup in the steady state. And then in the steady state operating condition is where we want to try to control of uh, the purity of the different products that are happening. Um, some of the, I guess, not ethical issues, well, maybe. ethical and business issues. Sorry, side note, if you have a business jet, what's the, what's the short word for business jet? It's going to be a buzz jet, right? But it's actually a biz jet. Sorry, that just popped in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Which you wouldn't think, that's the abbreviation for business is biz, right? Taking care of biz. Anyway. So, ethical standpoints is if your controller is really bad, what can happen? You got chemicals, I mean, maybe this is a chemical plant, or it is a chemical plant either way, but maybe it's volatile chemicals, right? And you go, oh, I'm going to bring in my neural net and just run this distillation column all over the place, back, essentially back the truck around the parking lot in a safe way, back the distillation column up or run the distillation column through all kinds of operating conditions. Some of those could be bad, right? It may blow up, it may catch on fire, it may create toxic fumes. So there's ethical issues. How do you collect training data? So you have to have you can't just go in there and not know anything about the system. You have to have a chemical engineer there to help you operate the thing and say, well, here's the range that we can operate this distillation column. So, so how to collect data is not just, well, what range of motion do we put our robot arm through, but what can we safely do with regard to this thing? And then from a business standpoint, just collecting the training data it may cost you a lot of money because you're wasting all of these chemicals when you run. So now we're starting to see well, neural nets sound like they're great, but there are some downsides to it. Collecting the data, running systems to get the data. You know, this could be true for a fighter jet, right? Flying a fighter jet and collecting data on that. That's expensive. And there is some danger in just turning a controller over, turning the jet over to the controller, just like turning a car over to some automated system. All right, three minutes till it launches. Three minutes till launch. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to get to today, because we're going to define state variables, and after about an hour of this, it's pretty late to take a break anyway. So you think there's three minutes till launch?
Are you stuck in the past? It's what? Pens would be as useful, especially in deep space probes like Nuke Horizons. So they could use RTGs, but then like RTGs are yeah, very, yeah, very, yeah, very, yeah, yeah, very yeah, far behind yeah, power. Yeah. So it would well, not be to refresh the page. Yeah, yeah, it would not be to refresh the page. Like where it says power all structure at, at the bottom. So it'll bring it up. No, maybe they could use RTGs. Yeah. They'd probably want to use solar, to be honest. Running stable down, select and shut one of them down and still perform the landing on over two. Uh, but here we come, we are crossing the one minute mark now into uh, the countdown. Until the second countdown is held a minute. Ah, uh, God. Okay. okay. So the countdown uh, uh, said, why? Not on the board. Okay. 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 It's been decent. Uh, you might want to find it. It's been decent. 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 It's been what <laughs>